Welcome to yet another edition of Who Moved the Market. I'm Surabhi Upadhyay. Well, the market's been in a tight range. As we speak, there's a bit of a decline going on. But if there's one trend that's emerged very, very clear today is that it's commodities that are really moving stocks, basically the equity market. Whether you're looking at some of the metal names, whether you're looking at sugar or even rice for that matter, rice stocks, by the way, in a falling market have been soaring 5, 6, 7 percent, depending on which company you're looking at. So what's behind these trends? Well, we have our in-house commodity expert with us on the show today. Manisha Gupta makes her debut on Who Moved the Market. Welcome to the show, Manisha. What a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and what a day. <laughs> uh, absolutely. We've got you here because it's very, very clear. The market's been in, in this range, trying to look out for cues and direction. So whatever happens to commodities, stocks tend to follow these days, right? Uh, I just wanted to start off first with, you know, uh, your, your overall thoughts on this China number that came out. And, and we'll talk about metals then. Uh, because I think a lot of people noticed how that GDP number, at least, was way above expectations, right, at 4.5%. So what's happening in your universe? It was to start <laughs> off with metals, at least. <laughs> well, yes. You know, Zabri, when you talk about commodities, you cannot but miss, uh, you know, cannot miss China yeah, at all. Yeah. Because, yes, uh, expectation of 2.9%, and we saw GDP coming at 4.5%. What a relief. And markets mm -hmm. were anticipating a stronger number in any mm -hmm. case. The first quarter wasn't so great, but March as a month was on the stronger side. Mm. And then we've seen retail sales numbers strong. Factory output was on the stronger side. The new car sales in China for the month of March gained up by nearly 10%. Not just that, the automobile output itself was up by 15%. So that is where the metal demand also seems to be coming in from. Mm -hmm. So every data that China has thrown out uh, for the month of March and the quarter tells you that the demand for metals clearly is on a rise. So it seems like that whole revenge buying that happened in 2021 or 22 here in India, that's happening in China now, right? The cars uh, data that you're saying. So obviously, I mean, automobile is a, is a huge industry in terms of commodity consumption, one of the huge industries. Uh, so what's been happening with the metal prices is this just a sentiment uh, move higher or is is there a, a real demand supply sort of dynamics to it that are at play as well so you know when you look at inventories they in any case have been on the lower side whether you look at ferrous or non ferrous for that matter mm -hmm. but just keeping it to generic right now as per your question well we are looking at stronger demand coming in from automobiles the housing sector also is on the rise here and then this is the, the second quarter of a calendar year always is a strong construction demand season as well because it's neither winters there's no snow it's mm -hmm. not monsoons yet so this is a quarter that actually sees a lot of demand and markets are hinging onto that so when you say strong demand, are you talking about India demand or China demand? Uh, uh, right overall now? construction demand. But overall this is the time in Asia yeah. where you don't have uh, rains or winters. It's not the rainy so season. So this is the construction yeah, yeah. season. Oh, okay. So strong demand from real estate, from autos. Uh, so basically for uh, ferrous prices, what has this meant? I mean, you mentioned inventory levels have been a little low. Let's talk steel first. And what are the dynamics here? So this is going to be a third straight year where China is looking at a lower output in sense of steel. The number that they have put out is less 2.3% as compared to previous year as well. That in any turn way should have been supportive. Mm. The other factor is that you are looking at demand now picking up. So when you look at on-ground inventory, that has seen a bit of a decline. We did see steel prices trading at a three-month lows 15 days back. But in last uh, seven or eight trading sessions, we've seen steel prices continue to see momentum and there is support coming in. So steel, its ingredient iron ore and its ingredient nickel all of these metals have moved in tandem and we've seen 3% of gains in steel in this week. Iron ore is up by 2.5% and nickel prices are up by nearly 10% in last seven trading sessions. Wow, that's a really sharp move. I mean, 10%, seven trading sessions, that's quite something. It is. So, okay, th that makes it very clear. This whole steel complex, uh, the metal itself, plus all the inputs, uh, all of it is moving higher. Uh, what's happening in non-steel on uh, the non-ferrous side of things? So copper is doing great as well. We're trading at a one-month highs onto this one. Zinc is trading at a multi-week highs. Aluminum prices overnight gained 2.5%, and we still have seen some strength continue into this one as well. So while the US dollar index, which is stuck between 100 to 100, to yeah. either say by the way that it moves yeah. does tend to impact metals, but all of these metals have seen inventories decline quite sharply. So when you look at uh, uh, copper, for example, the inventories are lowest since 2005. Zinc inventories lowest since 1989. Wow. Nickel inventories have continued to decline as well. So the inventories are lower. That is because last year was power rationing in China and European Union was dealing with gas crisis. So mm -hmm. while the mined concentrate is enough, but the refined, refined metals are lower. Okay. So that is the mismatch that is as of now fueling the prices. And you know, for the underlying commodity, I've been talking to a lot of global experts as well. And they say, yes, this is a good time to start picking them up. 
That's, that's quite amazing. And when I hear you say that, I mean, there are so many different sides to it. On one hand, you're talking about recession in the US and companies are not spending, etc. That's on the services side, of course. We're seeing what's happening with IT. And then this is really positive, you know, data that you're talking about. It gives us the sense that at least one part of the market is feeling bullish. Uh, so fair is doing well, non-fair is doing well. Um, anything else you want to add in metals before we talk to uh, talk about rice, which was a, the real big headline that caught my eye. But metals, anything else do we need to watch out for? So, you know, while recession, of course, is a bit of a concern, but as we've been talking, uh, all eyes on the third and fourth May. That is when the U.S. Fed meets and 25 basis point rate hike factored in. Yeah. So markets will want to watch out for that part of the deal mm -hmm. as well on mm -hmm. how much are we still looking at money coming in. And mm -hmm. the other side is going to be the China stimulus measure. So whatever uneven, mm -hmm. fragile recovery that we are seeing in China, mm -hmm. perhaps would be corrected with a stimulus measure measures is the reason metals are still about. Okay, so that's the Chinese who are pulling the oh, metals market higher, overall commodity market higher. Okay, great. That's metals. Now let's talk about rice. I woke up to this headline. I think a lot of people might have seen it across, you know, various platforms saying there is going to be a rice uh, shortage. A 20-year high rice shortage. What's happening and where is this shortage coming from? So this major is a Fitch report which suggests uh -huh. that this year uh, you could be looking at a rice shortage to the tune of 8.7 million tons. I mean, that's a big number, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, But not everybody in India agrees to that. They believe that, okay, the production may be on the lighter side, but the demand also is not so forthcoming. Okay. China is a major importer. South Africa is a major importer. Mm -hmm. And the kind of exports India is doing to UAE, US and other countries has been quite normal. So last Last year, when we exported 21 million tons worth of $11 billion worth of rice, that was a record high. It was 16% up on an year-on-year -year basis. But that was about the value, not the volume. 21 uh, million tons. Wait, I'm, I'm getting the number. $11 billion in value yeah. and 21 million tons. And that yes. was a, a record So 21 export. million tons is not a big deal. Okay. $11 billion is yes, because the, the rice prices were high. Ah, yes. Okay, so what's, what's been the increase already that the market has seen? Uh, so on the this, right is a, this is a number that already has been registered. But the right. point is that this is uh, for the previous financial yeah. year. The numbers are only coming in right now. And is the reason street is uh, reacting to this. And then okay. Fitch report came in just in right time <laughs> for the street to take it from both hands. But the point being that right now, because the demand is slightly lower and Indian production is great, the government mm -hmm. procurement is on the higher side as well. So okay. for India, as per se, there isn't so much of a concern. Having said that, yes, we export 80% uh, of the global basmati requirement that mm -hmm. it is. So that mm -hmm. always puts us in that uh, favorable position. And if indeed there is a global deficit or lower production elsewhere, then I guess, and since you're mentioning that our production is absolutely on track, then I guess Basmati Please rice stand. exporters yes. could stand together. And that explains the, the moves on a KRBL, on LT foods or a Kohinoor foods. A lot of these uh, do, of course, uh, supply and export to the international markets as well. Uh, so that's, that's rice. Uh, but you've been telling us, I remember you saying on um, one of our other shows as well, even coffee, I mean, a lot of other agri-commodities are going through the roof. What's happening really? Oh, I have a list ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, sugar, we haven't spoken about sugar. Uh, I remember you mentioning that even uh, global sugar prices uh, are pushing higher. So let's cover sugar first. Okay. And then, oh God, sugar, coffee, both <laughs> going higher, rice going higher, my bill's going up. But anyway, more on that later. Let's talk sugar. Okay, 11-year highs for the raw sugar prices mm -hmm. and the white refined sugar that is, that one is trading at a seven-month highs. Mm -hmm. For the Indian markets, in the last one, we've seen prices gain up by nearly 9%. And when you look at the x mill prices now, they are at 3,800 rupees per quintal after a very, very long time. So we do understand that the sugar production till time in India is 5% lower as compared to last year. Also, last year we exported record 11.2 million tons. Mm -hmm. This time there's a cap at 6 million tons because there's a lot of divergence now happening to ethanol, ethanol as well. Right. And with El Nino coming in and lower production in Brazil, Thailand increasing their sugar export prices and we're looking at a sugar deficit, I think this is a space that will continue to be sweet for investors. Oh, wow. So uh, let me just sort of go back and, and recap this. You're saying that uh, already in this sugar year, our production is down uh, 5% mm. over mm. last year. And we haven't even seen the impact of El Nino as yet. So yeah. uh, but these unseasonal rains, I know there was a lot of chatter earlier in April. Have they had any impact, any role to play as well in this? Well, absolutely. You know, this, is a, this was a season that we mm. saw mills shutting their mills, shutting, crushing season two months prior to what they do normally. That is because the cane started coming in early because of the unseasonal rains and then a heat wave and etc. You mm. saw flowering happen earlier. The yields were lower and we have suffered in Maharashtra and Karnataka in sense of production. Okay, so that explains why production probably is going to be on the lower side. Uh, just a you know, quick question. The cap, uh, export cap remains at 
six million, uh, six right. million tons. You said. That's right. Is the industry hoping for that to be lifted? I mean, I don't know. I, I get the government's concern that you want to divert more and more uh, towards ethanol production. But what's the the chatter on this on this export cap? So the companies or the mills were hoping that you would see more number than that. And government also had said that first tranche is 6 million tons. If the crop is good and there's enough availability and the buffer stock requirements are complete, then we will allow you more. But clearly with the kind of number of sugar uh, output coming in, that doesn't look likely, but we still are waiting for the final number and then the Indian consumption as well, which, by the way, is expected to also hit a record at 27.5 to 28 million tons. So, yes, we are eating a lot of sugar. And you know what? I was talking to Amul uh, you yesterday. You definitely <laughs> are. I know you're not we eating have to sugar. To this. So, <laughs> last year, the sale of ice cream jumped up by 40% for Amul. And yeah. this year, they're anticipating a 20% jump on that. So that's as much ice cream we I don't know if this really counts or not, but <laughs> over the weekend I was out in Juhu. I crossed the street <laughs> and it was like a complete rush, a complete storm. And I wondered what's going on. And I realized it was an ice cream. But I'm, I should have just I, taken a picture. <laughs> there were like at least 50 people standing there. At, maybe it was one of the main Juhu outlets. <laughs> but people are really having a lot of ice cream for sure. Uh, milk, um, uh, coffee, yeah. everything's going up. What's happening, Manisha? So here as well, uh, the unseasonal rains and the heat wave that we've mm -hmm. seen, not just in India, but across mm -hmm. globe, clearly seems to be supportive. So for the Indian markets itself, we've seen milk prices gain up by 15% in 15 months. Mm -hmm. there, are, there is crop concerns for cocoa, where the prices are trading at... Uh, 2016 highs mm -hmm. and cocoa prices have gained up by 20% already in 2023. So that's where your uh, chocolate prices rise will come in from. Rubber price is trading at a five-week highs. Soya bean price is trading at a five-week highs. And I have a list here, by the way, which says cotton trading at six-week highs. Global wheat is trading at a one-month highs. And there's a longer list. I think what's happened is that everybody uh, from the Lal Street or many people from the Lal Street <laughs> have already moved to the commodity markets and that's where the, the price surge and is that's happening. that's exactly the point, you know, the fundamentals are strong. So the global speculative money also is supporting this, ensuring that the prices stay there. Because global equities aren't doing anything, at least when I mean, US markets are, but Indian equities orange aren't doing anything. Orange juice globally is trading at an all-time highs. My God, <laughs> orange juice is trading... I, what's going on? It gets traded, you know that, right? Yes, I, yeah. I know, but I never thought that you know that could be a market which could also touch these kind of highs. Yeah. So, just so to round things off, is this more of investor speculation, a lot of money chasing ideas and equities aren't doing much? So, Bitcoin's up, by the way. 30,000. <laughs> so, is it more of that? Is it trading speculation? Or how much of it do you think is real underlying demand, uh, supply so, you know, concern? Fundamentals are supportive for sure. And with the mm -hmm. kind of demand that we see coming back is supportive. And add to that the speculative money as well. So mm -hmm. money managers are putting money there. You know, there's, there are reports suggesting that in the first quarter, or even when you look at 2022-23, mm -hmm. it is the commodity traders which have made a record killing when it comes to profits there. Everybody who was trading in commodities and was long made money. And that's exactly the phenomena that we are seeing right now as well. And a lot of chartist friends of mine tell me that mm -hmm. soft commodities early and now metals is the way to go. My God, I think anybody who listens to you today uh, will probably see a drop in equity trading volumes tomorrow because yeah. that, that population would have moved to the commodity markets by, by tomorrow. They have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Manisha. That was uh, fun, exciting and very, very informative. Uh, thank you for joining in and giving us so many insights today. Thank you. All right, there you have it. That is the global commodity rush, and a lot of that is uh, playing out in India, also making its way to stock prices on the Lull Street. That's it on this episode of Who Moved the Market. We'll see you again tomorrow with another theme.